Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another Wednesday webinar. How's everyone doing? Good. <laughs> yeah, we're good. <laughs> welcome, welcome. I'm joined tonight with Silma Sain, Bruno Samal, and Greg for Mark. I um, hope you've had a good week. Let's get started. Uh, one of the first questions we have tonight is, what is the next step once you've done a letter of demand and the tenant uh, hasn't paid and that time period has now lapsed? Uh, what is the next step? Um, also, what's going on with these, this moratorium on evictions? Is that still applicable? Um, Phil, I don't know if you could maybe answer this question for us. Yes, I'm happy to, especially on the moratorium on evictions. I must say it's a, a very interesting thing, Ron. I've had that a few times this week, actually, uh, from, from a reporter as well, um, and from quite a few rental agents, landlords, a lot of people that still has this perception that there is a moratorium on evictions. And I think it's actually a very important thing to address. Even during full lockdown, level five, the court directives didn't allow us specifically, didn't allow us to do evictions, but there wasn't um, something specific like saying um, there is a moratorium. We weren't allowed to bring eviction applications specifically, but there was a lot of sort of causes of action that you weren't allowed to bring. There was a lot of applications that you weren't allowed to bring. So the, I, I think it's very important to clarify that even though we couldn't bring eviction applications during that time, it wasn't because government's intention was to put a moratorium on evictions and as such, actually between the lines say that tenants shouldn't, be, uh, shouldn't have to pay rent. That wasn't the case at all. It was just in full lockdown. There was a pause on pretty much everything from the deeds office to, through to evictions. But in level four, regulation 19 specifically said that we are allowed to do evictions and that we are, not, we are just not allowed to execute our eviction orders. So I think it's something very important to, to distinguish because I think it did create the impression that there is a moratorium on evictions. And even though we couldn't do evictions for the, the full lockdown, um, we are up and running. And I think, I think everybody can see um, uh, Greg, Bruno and myself are smiling much, much more now than we did two or three weeks ago because our offices were closed and we couldn't approach court. And now we are all running. Uh, we can obtain eviction orders and we can then, um, even on, in specific situations, get a court order to execute, even in level four. So actually send the sheriff to do the eviction in specific circumstances. But other than that, you sit with, you issue your warrant of execution and you wait uh, for the appropriate level to execute. It's as simple as that. But now I didn't answer the question on what do you do when your demand labs, uh, Bruno? Before you go on, gonna... Sona, sorry. Yes. Sorry, um, was that you, Bruno? Sorry? No. Sorry, was it. Ron, was, was someone going to ask him something? No, you go for it. Apologies. No, sorry. you can go ahead. Um, go ahead. <laughs> sorry, apologies. I, um, I was never aware that there was any attempt by the court to stop us bringing eviction applications. The moment the the first few days of lockdown was over. During those first few lockdowns, the urgent court only was open and they were only dealing with the flashpoints arising from, um, from COVID. Literally in that first week, by the second week already, we were carrying on in the unopposed court, albeit online, with eviction applications and, and others. So, you know, no one ever attempted to dissuade us from bringing the court process. I, it's not relevant. I just wanted to mention that there was n no stage where the High Court any, anyway was barred to, mm -hmm. to us carrying on with the eviction mm -hmm. process. And we've been doing that. We've, we've in fact got one or two where we are looking for an order that people be evicted. It is a relocation type matter on open land, even, even if lockdown is still on. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to mention. No, thanks, Greg. I'm, I'm glad you did, because I think there was this perception that evictions was a special yeah. Yeah. thing that people couldn't do. And it, it, yeah. it was definitely, it wasn't, it yeah, wasn't absolutely. that. 
In truth, it was, it was the same regulation said you couldn't evict and you couldn't execute a warrant of execution. Yes. So clearly what they envisaged was, and I think it was legit at that stage, um, you don't want a sheriff going somewhere and doing something during that yes. bit of the hard lockdown. So e evictions yes. and warrants of execution were, were banded in together. And even new process. Yeah. I mean, at the time, new process was paused as I think uh, that's exactly. I've, I had the same feeling. Like it's we more just about went ahead. The sheriff, I believe. That. We just went ahead unissued. We went ahead unissued to say mm -hmm. if the courts won't issue, we're serving it anyway, and, yeah. and it's working fine. Yeah, that's we, exactly. We true. we begged we begged forgiveness later. In other <laughs> words, you know, we said in our papers that there are a number of things we can't do as a result of lockdown. And we will ask for condemnation when the time comes. Mm. Look, one can understand, obviously, the, when, when the regulations uh, initially came out, it was an attempt to maintain the status quo. They didn't want people sure. on the street. They didn't want yeah. uh, movables removed for no reason at all. So everyone yeah. just stay at home, stay put while we think of something. It's understandable. Uh, but, but you are right. The intention was never to stop evictions. It was to control the situation. Now moving on to le level four, it's become more of an execution question. So the courts yeah. aren't saying that people um, shouldn't be evicted. They're saying, listen, we're going to control the processes. Uh, so we're going to try to stop these evictions, but we will consider it under certain circumstances. Otherwise, let's just you know, uh, put it on hold until we get to the next level. Uh, so again, just trying to control the situation, thinking level four does need a certain level of people mm -hmm. staying at home. So we're not going to yeah. allow a lot of movement. Um, and again, like everyone said, the, the, the bottom line is we've been going to court. Uh, we've been trying to we've been trying to get the matters heard. We've been trying to get the orders. Um, mm. you know, somebody asked me today. I was on a, a radio interview today, and they asked me what the difference is between um, between uh, uh, pre lockdown and post lockdown. And one of the explanations was, well, look, from a court perspective, nothing much except the fact that outside of the court, the sheriffs, some sheriffs aren't serving as often or aren't serving at all. Mm. So initiating yeah. This is, are diffi is difficult. Um, yeah. But I see some sheriffs, like, for example, Corne from Halfway House, let me know that they're starting now to, to roll yeah. out uh, just normal services, whereas other guys, you still can't get hold of them. So yeah. is everything the same? Not exactly. The process is there, but we're still trying to convince sheriffs to do a couple of things. And obviously, once we do get an order, we may just need to wait a little bit before we can yeah. actually execute. What happens no, in agreed. is... Yeah, is yeah, it's your, it's, it's anyone's guess. Can so, I ask, Silna, yeah. I, I completely agree. Um, Silna, can I ask you to deal with, it's an issue that, that's arisen in our office in the last 24 hours. The, the, <laughs> some say that um, once your 20, 20 days breach are up, you've got to give another month or another 20 days. Please deal with that. <laughs> Why are you giving it to me? Oh, you know I'll be because diplomatic. you're good at it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Okay, no. So this is one of my favorite things when I do training to talk about because what is um, the, uh, your mura letter, your letter of demand, and what does it look like then on the other end? Uh, so now coming back to to the actual question, and and then I'll I'll deal with the cancellation, um, Greg. So you give somebody a notice period to remedy his breach. In practice, people started referring to that letter that is actually a Mura letter, Mura being Latin for default, a Mura letter. But now people started calling it a, a, a letter of demand or a bridge letter or a, what's the other thing they call it? Uh, oh, a terms letter. Yeah, terms letter. A terms yeah. letter. Same thing. Um, so once you send that letter, you must give the person a certain amount of time. And now I'm only talking about lease agreements. This is not the guy that's just randomly squatting. You, how you deal with that notice to tell him to leave is very different. That notice is usually a court application served by the sheriff. Um, so we're talking about a lease agreement where the tenant's not paying rent. You give him a time period to remedy his breach. That time period will be 20 business days if this lease agreement is governed by the Consumer Protection Act. So if the lease agreement is for a fixed period and the agreement in the agreement, there is a natural person. 
be it the landlord or a tenant, um, there's a natural person, then you need to give the tenant 20 business days to remedy his breach. If he doesn't remedy his breach in full, he doesn't pay his full outstanding rent that is due. You can cancel the agreement. If he's still owing you 20 bucks, he hasn't remedied his breach in full, we can cancel and we can commence with eviction. And then people say, but it's so unfair um, that he tried to pay. Okay, cool, but that's a negotiation in law. If he hasn't remedied his breach in full, he hasn't remedied and you can cancel. Cancellation of a lease agreement means on that moment of cancellation, the lease agreement is no longer there. Now, it's very important to understand that a tenant's right to occupy a premises, his right of occupation, is a personal right that is derived from the lease agreement. Without the lease agreement, the right of occupation can't vest with the tenant anymore. It's gone. He doesn't have it anymore. What does that make the tenant? An illegal occupant. So on the moment of cancellation, you have an illegal occupant. Now, this is something very important, and I'm glad I have two attorneys um, to back me on this conversation because there is a lot of attorneys that are still cancelling the lease agreements in the process. What I mean by that is in the summons, and this is usually the guys that does evictions on, on action as well. Here and there, we have to do action, but that's a conversation for another day. I'm very sure uh, Bruno, Greg, and I, all of us, will we'll do the majority of our evictions on application because that's the quickest process. But a lot, of, a lot of guys, and I'm really not bashing other attorneys, I'm really not. This is just the difference between eviction experts and general practitioners. So your typical general practitioner will very often attempt to commence his eviction on action, so on a summons, and then cancel the lease agreement in the summons. The problem that you have with that is now there's a whole time period from this time you could have cancelled to cancellation plus in the action in the summons they asked the court to confirm the cancellation so now suddenly it leaves the door open for dispute around when was there a cancellation and if there wasn't cancellation what is the damages claim? Is it is the, it rent or is it a damages claim? Is it holding over damages? What is this? So our advice is always that on the 20 business days or the seven days, whatever the lease agreement or legislation allows, on that day, you need to cancel the lease agreement with a separate notice. And that notice will be a letter that is called a cancellation letter. Some people call it a notice to vacate. Please, guys, just remember, even if it's called a notice to vacate, it's not court process yet. It's a letter. So you send a letter saying that you haven't remedied your breach. The contract is now cancelled. Your right to occupy has been cancelled. You need to vacate the premises immediately. If you give a guy a week, a month, two months, three months, two days to vacate it, after cancellation, you are creating a new right of occupation. And that right of occupation turns around, bites you straight in the face when you have to do the eviction. Because now you need to cancel the new right that was created. I know it sounds harsh, guys, to cancel and say you need to vacate immediately. Just remember this tenant hasn't paid his rent. He had time to remedy his breach. He had time to make other arrangements on cancellation. He's in illegal occupation. You do not give, need to give him any more time to vacate. We want to commence with eviction the next morning. Why? Because we want money to pay for our offices or to pay our salaries. No, this is because we as eviction experts know an eviction on a good day residential eviction on a good day is going to take you two months and now with the level that our court rolls are congested probably we don't even know at this stage how long an eviction will take because the rolls are more congested we know on a quick easy painless eviction it's a two months process so this is why we want to commence eviction immediately not to write the fees 
but to save you from having a tenant in the occupant, an illegal occupant in the premises, um, and you can't place a new paying tenant. This is why we advise commencement immediately on cancellation. Greg, were you happy with my answer? You missed Exceedingly happy. <laughs> Exceedingly happy. But what I want to ask you is, have you picked up in Cape Town that the Cape Town Tribunal ap appears to suggest that on that termination, they are still entitled to further time to vacate, which is, of course, nonsense. And I picked up that that misinterpretation even seems to be finding its way into the Cape Town courts, which is very we worrying because that's simply wrong. With all due respect to the tribunal and the tribunal commissioners, they have also, and still to this day, very often deny the application of the Consumer Protection Act on leases. Okay, so that's can what I, you're dealing with. Can I, can I leave it? Was that diplomatic? Can I get the diplomatic point? Exceedingly diplomatic. <laughs> uh, just to touch on But it's wrong. I mean, mistake. any, su yeah. sorry, Bruna, forgive me. No, no, go for it. Any <laughs> suggestion that on termination, people are, in, are entitled to a further 20 days, one month, whatever, is simply wrong. Mm. And don't yeah. let anybody, certainly not tribunals, try and tell you that that is the case. Yes, um, thank you. That's, that, that was more clear than mine. So, so to touch on Greg's oh, point, it's actually quite interesting. Um, uh, the, so obviously there's nothing in any law that requires that further days be granted or be given for someone to vacate uh, property. Yet it's something that you consistently see in practice. People wait, people don't notify at the right point. They, uh, after the cancellation, they give another month for someone to move out. And sometimes I've even had situations where the courts have asked, but after the letter of demand, did you give sufficient time to move out? Although cancellation, makes the occupation unlawful and the person should be moving out immediately. So I think that that is actually just a kind of a bad practice or bad habit that's been created. Um, but it is, it's got no basis in law and it's got no basis in fairness because what I end up doing, even on my letters of demand or terms letters or whatever you want to call them, I even mention there that the expectation is that if they don't remedy, they're out. So they can consider this as a notice to vacate because I'm informing mm. them that their right mm. to occupy is going to be terminated. So I get yeah, that yeah. right yeah, right at the beginning. Um, and then just to touch on Sona's point, um, and uh, almost just to emphasize that after cancellation, you run the risk of allowing a person to stay on the property and almost um, like creating a new right of occupation, but also just it, not even just after cancellation, after letter of demand or terms letter, and before cancellation, what happens is, and I find this a lot with clients, is they send out the 20 business days. Then suddenly there's these negotiations happening about when payments are going to take place, but you can stay till this date if you make payment. And by the time it gets to me, they come and tell me, listen, but I've sent out the 20 days. Yeah, but no, you haven't. Unfortunately, I need to send it out again because yeah. the, the, the situations become so confused that we... We, it's almost, we need to now ask them to remedy their breach again mm -hmm. because way too many indulgences were granted and way too many rights were almost given and it's very yeah. confusing. Uh, so be decisive. Even if you are going to negotiate, there's ways of doing that where you don't prejudice your notice periods. Yeah. Uh, but you can negotiate without creating these, um, these rights that you later then have to go try and, and remedy again or ask them to remedy. And please run it past your attorney. Mm. I, I, I'll tell a quick story. I've once had a matter, guys. It was one of those, you know, sometimes you have that one eviction that follows you. And by the time your file loses color, do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> you guys mm -hmm. know exactly what I'm talking yeah. about. Like the yep. file, yes, I'm like starting to cool in and the file isn't the same yellow you used to be <laughs> when we started. It was one of those. So the matter, I think it was, it was a, 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 an insolvency sale. So the whole basis of the thing went pear-shaped and there was a lease agreement. It was one of those long, painful things that I think only about 16 months later, I ended up in South Gauteng High Court. It was one of those painful ones. You guys know exactly what I'm on about. Yeah. Finally, I'm in court. Supplementary affidavit filed on the morning mm. with my client three months before that date sending a letter to the tenant saying well illegal occupant mm -hmm. 
if you pay this amount, you can stay until then. Mm. Illegal occupant paid that. That's it agreement that occurred here on the side that I knew nothing about. And guess what? Client was upset about paying my fee for attending to mm. court that day. And I'm thinking, you messed up your own case. My, mm. my good sir, this case actually ended up being reported. So I didn't, won't give you the nail, give, give the citation afterwards. But it was one of those where it would have been a clear, relatively easy, yet traumatic time to get to court, but it would have been an easy eviction. And my own client buggered his own case. And I think that's, Bruno, your point is 100% accurate. Please, please, please don't try and help. I have uh, my, my kids, I always say to them, Please, you're not helping right now. If I'm trying to clean or do something, I'm like, guys, you're not helping. Please stop helping. And I think we want to say that with all the love in our hearts to our clients yeah, sometimes as well. Just, yeah. just stop. <laughs> hmm. Look, let me say that it's, it's very, you know, I, I always say to clients that an eviction process is really just an enhanced collection mechanism. Um, so, it's quite in order to give a breach letter, let the breach period go a little bit past, because that's an opportunity for someone to come along with their checkbook. Then even the termination letter, mm. frequently people don't want to get rid of the, the tenant, they simply want them to start paying. So even a termination letter, they'll get it, come and talk. You know, you don't say this, but of course that opportunity mm. is there. Even service of the of the eviction application and then the pie notice and you know we've all we've all had matters that have settled mm. with payment and then you know mm. happy ever after mm. even by that means so you know yeah. it's it's not to say you literally have to hit everything on the mark you've got to you've got to watch the danger of potentially innovating and bruno's comment is very very important about engagement with these guys with these non-paying tenants, um, you know, one one needs to be accurate, but also one doesn't need to worry that mm. if you don't, if it's not the, what do they used to call it, the perfect troth, that you're going to get into trouble later. Mm. It's more yeah. a case of do the one thing. If you if you still have hope of a tenant coming and paying, give them a few days to do so. You're not going to get into trouble for a few days. As you mm. say, Silna, you're going to get in trouble for collecting rental. Mm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And even then, even then, if I may, um, yeah. the usual imperative to avoid evictions is so strong that you can reg you could regulate an interim mechanism short of eviction that involved that in involved payment in a way that it wouldn't under undermine your case should that yeah. be appropriate to mm. the to the circumstances mm. yes i think that's it's important. unusual the romans and the dutch would spin in their graves but with the constitutional imperative to avoid evictions we can be imaginative in a way that will bring in money it won't be called rental mm. prevent eviction and sort of have people carry on with some kind of modus prevent they pen, prevent depending mm. some some end date where either they will leave or they will or they will sign a fresh lease. Mm, yeah, I want to talk about something just because you opened the door, Greg. Rowan, I'm I'm sorry, we just hijacked your one question. You can basically throw in one question. We'll run with it for like <laughs> days. You guys are making you guys are making my job very easy this evening. So please <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> so I want to talk about the tribunal. Just because you started it, Greg, yeah. <laughs> you started it. <laughs> yeah. um, so one of the big issues that I have and that I see with clients, I see this with especially rental agents, the tribunal isn't making their lives any easier. So the problem and why it's not making their lives easier is I think what people don't understand is that the tribunal is not a court. The tribunal is like the magistrate's court, a creature of statute, but even more limited, uh, with even more limited jurisdiction and more limited powers. Something crucial to know is the tribunal does not, does not have 
the jurisdiction to grant an eviction order. They do these settlement negotiations that seems like a sort of quasi-eviction, quasi, -eviction, quasi is, is Latin for not real, sort of fake thing on this side. Was that a good translation? Because I almost. <laughs> do you have a better one? No, I'm worried about yours. <laughs> it means almost. <laughs> <laughs> almost. Ooh. So quasi Let me not say the joke that came to mind. <laughs> I know. I could see what the word was. <laughs> That's why I paused. <laughs> so uh, uh, it, it's not an eviction order. The tribunal does not have the jurisdiction to grant him, uh, the eviction orders. They are only allowed to work within the scope of the Rental Housing Act. The Rental Housing Act creates the tribunal and the powers that the tribunal have exclusively comes from the Rental Housing Act and the regulations to the Rental Housing Act. So for the tribunal to start interpreting things like, does the CPI apply? When can a landlord claim damages for early cancellation? What's the limit of your cancellation? That is far, far beyond the powers of the tribunal. And the person watching this might not know that and might see the tribunal as something similar to a court. But I think it's important to know, guys, it's not. If you get a bad order from the tribunal, why people aren't correcting it is the correct process is to take it um, for review to the High Court. And the scary part is the High Court review process sends it right back to the tribunal mm -hmm. to re, to re um, adjudicate on the matter. This is why the tribunals aren't getting fixed. We are currently running a pro bono matter on cancellation where the tribunal again denied a landlord the right to claim a damages uh, to claim damages from a tenant for early cancellation so i've decided this is it it's done i'm taking it pro bono um clear from my office is, is running the matter we're taking it pro bono to the high court um at, with a specific application for the high court to direct the tribunal in the re-adjudication of the matter. Whether it's going to work or not, I don't know. But why I'm saying this is I don't think people understand exactly how limited the tribunal's powers are. And the reason why it's not getting to correct it is unfortunately because people don't want to spend the money to take it to, to a higher court uh, to get it fixed. Do you agree with me or am I just being No, I, I think on the, on the point that you raise, you, you, you must be right. Um, I have to say that I'm a big fan of the tribunal um, and I've had some very, very good hearings in front of the tribunal, but you must remember the nature of my practice is we, get into the, we sometimes have these large, very highly contested matters with lots of subtext, mm -hmm. et cetera. And I've found the, the tribunal to be very, um, very fair and very proper and all of those things. Let me say on the, on the point of interpretation of law, um, that is where the potential uh, difficulty comes in. And obviously, Silna, as you very correctly and properly done, um, you, you're taking that element on, on review. Um, the, the downside with the tribunal from a landlord perspective is that it takes forever to get in front of the tribunal. Whereas, a um, you know a, something that might upset a tenant will get to the tribunal very fast. There does appear to be an element of partiality in the bureaucracy of the tribunal, but not the tribunal itself. The tribunal itself, I've always found um, uh, impeccably fair, and I've and I've and I quite enjoy. In fact, I very much enjoy going there for the specific type of matter. My way of thinking is that the, um, the tribunal is exceptional in a, a, I won't say a small, let's say, let's say an, an issue between a tenant with bona fides and a landlord with bona fides where they've literally yes. hit a stumbling block. Mm. And, Media, and they're very good with that. Absolutely. Mm. And that to me yes. is much of the, um, much of the benefit of the tribunal, but as I say, in some real humdinger matters at massive scale with, you know, properly lawyered up on both sides. We've had some exceptional hearings as well. 
subject to your caveat, uh, which which is a real thing, Sona. Yeah. I'm so glad my, to hear that. Uh, my yeah. experience with the tribunal, it kind of touches on both of yours, because on the one hand, um, and I mean, we had this discussion a few days ago, a few weeks ago regarding mediation and the eviction process. And what, mm. I, what I found was, I, I don't remember whether it was Yeovil or Hillbrow, but there was particularly eviction on a building that we were attending to there. And the landlord was stubborn, the tenants were stubborn, and going to court wasn't going to help anyone. Somehow mm. the matter landed up before the tribunal. I think one of the, um, one of the tenants uh, uh, laid the complaint. And before the, the, amazingly, before the tribunal, um, all this laundry started to come out. And we started realizing what the, where the pains were and starting, started to treat this on a more, let's try to resolve the problem as opposed to uh, get to that end solution, which is important, granted. But we actually found that the road there, we had a better road to get there. And all this, for example, there were issues regarding uh, uh, quality and the actual value of the rent. And the tribunal, I think within two or three months, heard the matter, did an inspection in loco, so basically went to the building, uh, checked it out, came back with their assessments, and made an order based on those assessments. So in those particular eviction, in that eviction, I found that by granting the opportunity of airing out the issues, we actually got, uh, we got an order that people were more willing to abide, as opposed to uh, when an order is just like forced down somebody's throat and they don't understand why. But on the flip side of it, I do have to agree that um, I, don't, I find that tenants that go to the tribunal don't get the matters heard fast enough. Um, it almost feels, and this is just a perception, but it, uh, the, the tribunal almost starts feeling like the CCMA, where it leans yeah. more towards the one party than the other party. So tenants fear the tribunal, and obviously the big one being the fact that if, you, if something's before the tribunal, you can't now go and institute, or you shouldn't, there's, there's a stay on eviction processes. So while it's pending, you now need to wait. Whereas mm -hmm. at least in court, you can run both simultaneously. Mm -hmm. The tribunal doesn't let you do that. That also creates a bit of a problem where I wouldn't mind going, listen, go to the tribunal to collect your rent or let the, if the tenant complains, it's okay, but we can start the process in the meantime. We can't do that. It's, mm -hmm. it's just unfortunate. Well, to that's that's something I was going to comment on. Um, my own my own experience is that the tribunal itself, as a panel, is impeccably fair. The bureaucracy is knee jerk pro tenant. There's no there's no denying. I'm talking about the the people who run the yeah. the, the office and the administration. The tribunal itself, I've 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 never I've never had a complaint about. Let me say though, because that's an important point that you raise, Bruno. Um, the, the Rental Housing Act says that when a complaint has been laid with the tribunal or um, uh, until resolved or a period of three months, you can't institute eviction proceedings. And people are very quick to strategically lay a complaint with the tribunal in order to delay eviction. What they don't tell you, though, is if you're in arrears with your rental, that protection doesn't apply. So... If someone is due to pay 100 Rand rent and you take it up to 110 Rand um, and they don't and they stick with 100 but pay the 100 and dispute the, the increase, you can't institute eviction. Uh, but if they, if they don't pay anything or if they short pay on the rent, you can. I think it's section 13F something something. So that's not mentioned very often. Very quickly, the bureaucracy will tell you, you can't evict. But mm. if someone is in arrears with their rental, you can. And, the, mm. you know, on the subject, I mean, I'm not, I accept your point, um, Bruno, on the, on the mediation thing. And, and every now and again, there's a circumstance where it might assist. Mm. In general terms, I'm very resistant to the, to the concept of mediation in an eviction matter because it only benefits the incumbent. Because mm. every... Every rental cycle missed is lost by the landlord and gained by the ex-tenant. And if you had to insert a mediation um, process, to me, it would have the effect of extending the process. And that, to me, is not desirable. Mostly, you're in a binary position. Um, the prospect of a successful mediation is, is very, very slim. 
So I, I think we on this side of the table in the industry must, um, must resist any attempts to, mm. to insert a mediation process. If you have to have one, have it while the court process mm, that, goes through its motions. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, Greg, if I can add my 10 cents to your the moratorium while there is a, a matter in the tribunal, the three months or whenever the matter is resolved, um, and you saying, um, unless there's outstanding rent, I think something important to add to that is actually for the landlord, so now outlines, uh, or unless there's outstanding maintenance. Mm. So I think it's important for, for people to understand that the tribunal then views uh, payment of rent and maintenance by the landlord, weirdly, as the two as the two sort of similar things. So for the landlord that hasn't done maintenance for five years, and now you want to convince the court um, that you can proceed with the eviction while there's a pending uh, drama about maintenance in the tribunal, um, that that landlord will have a problem. So that's but, just my but thing. Sorry, is, is that even the, is is that suggesting? that you can withhold rental if there's no maintenance? No, uh, no, 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 not at all, not at all. Um, what I'm saying is the landlord will not get the same benefit if, if he's withholding maintenance, the tribunal views it the same oh, as the okay. tenant not paying okay. rent. Oh, no, okay. definitely not, no, 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 okay. no. I think okay. that's a good one. You're very, definitely not allowed to withhold rent for, for lack of maintenance, okay. no, I'm with you. My, if I, if I may just point out, my, my experience, particularly in um, more contested matters, is that tenants who aren't paying will approach every single free yeah. venue that they can. The estate agent board, the tribunal, the police, the local... The law counselor, society. The mm. law society, <laughs> the, any, any entity you'd care yes. to name... Where they can post lay a charge. Office. <laughs> yeah. Post office, yeah. The report, reporting people where it costs nothing, in the hope that something will stick, and it's and it's a strategy. It's obviously the tribunal strategy is um, is a good one because if you don't, if you're not aware of that little bit about the about having to continue rent or it technically will delay, delay an eviction, but yeah, as you. People trying to make use of every single free option. Um, it's it's a it's a regular thing, and lay, you know saying the most. Oh, you you'll find this a lot in the suburbs. A protection order, you know things oh, yeah, like no. that. So no. you've been served with a notice of breach, mm. and you run off to the to the magistrate's court and try and get a protection order because someone's threatening to evict you. Yeah. Invariably, the um, the rental, um, the rental tribunal complaint will say unlawful eviction. When all that's happened, you've given the guy a breach letter. Mm. You know, so so it's designed to intimidate the unwary. Mm. I think I think um, especially on a, a legislative perspective, we need to be mindful of those abuses because over the mm. last. What doing evictions myself, like over the last what 13, 15 years, every single time somebody it, it, those angles exist, people start milking it. You actually start becoming more familiar with these whatever tribunals or bodies just because yeah. they're there all the time. Evictions yeah. in specific areas, you actually get to know the cops. The very because, much so. Eventually, they call you and like, What are you doing this week? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm trying to evict that guy, but apparently, he's come to see you. So it, it, I do agree with you. The problem is we can't have a situation where if there were to be mediation, that it stays the process pending mediation and that it needs to be done. Um, otherwise, it, the summons is premature. Sorry, the application is premature. Uh, things like that will never work because it will just delay mm -hmm. evictions and collections forever. So even though there's a value to mediation, it would have to be done in such a way where uh, no, no abuse. Uh, there can't be any abuse, and at the mm. moment, that's very difficult to regulate. Yeah, Agreed. Rowan, are we giving you a um, turn again? <laughs> <laughs> now we know. Now I know when I give three attorneys free reign on a question, how long they can actually go on for. <laughs> we um, can still go, eh? <laughs> no, that's the thing. I need to actually tell you guys that we've run out of time, um, <laughs> and that's. <laughs> 
<laughs> we've run out of time this evening, but thank you very much, guys. You've got you've, you've definitely answered quite a few questions, some unanswered, uh, unasked as well. But um, <laughs> thanks very much to everyone else who's watching. If you have any questions for next week, please be sure to ask them so that <laughs> so we can ignore we them. can discuss them. Because if <laughs> if I let these two go again, we're just going to be going and going and going. So if Thanks, you have Ryan. any questions at all, um, please comment and let us know. But thank you so much, Bruno, still no Greg. It was a great conversation tonight. A lot thank of topics you. touched. Um, and thanks so much. And we'll see you guys next week. Awesome. Well, you. actually, actually, now is my time to butt in because unfortunately <laughs> for, for our loyal and regular already, I can't believe we have loyal and regular viewers after like five shows but anyway yeah. um that's a thing but everybody got pretty used to rowan unfortunately tonight is the last wednesday webinar when rowan joined us rowan i think we've weaned ourselves ourselves off purposefully tonight so i think from <laughs> next week we will probably be able to wing it just give us like one thing and cool. we run with it, and then but, I'll let um, you it exactly but thank you so much for hosting us um, for for the sort of good problem. luck with uh, Ron is uh, is joining a company um, where he will be uh, be a legal advisor on commercial properties. So Ron, I know you're the best <laughs> the best guy for the job, and it's really well, I've learned sad. so much from all of you. So thank you as well. <laughs> and it's sad to see you go, but thank you so much for for getting the Property Law Alliance off the ground on the Wednesday webinars. Yeah, thanks so thank much. you guys so much for the opportunity. Thanks, guys. And if, as we said before, you did an incredible job. So there's always a career for you in media. <laughs> thank you. Certainly. Thank you. You guys are making me blush here. Like, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank Cheers, you very guys. much. I appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.